A Psychoanalysis of Contemporary Environmentalism. In his book Apocalypse Never, Michael Schellenberger criticizes environmental alarmism, which is the systematic exaggeration and misrepresentation of facts surrounding environmental issues such as climate change. In previous lectures, we looked at Schellenberger's take on these. They argue that much of the rhetoric from environmentalists surrounding these issues was alarmist. I wouldn't go so far as agreeing with Schellenberger about what most environmentalists say and think, but he is right about at least some. For instance, consider former Vice President Al Gore, who claimed that sea levels may rise 20 feet in the near future. Or consider New York Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who stated in 2019 that the world will end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. And finally, think about activist Greta Thunberg, who put it bluntly, I don't want you to have hope. I want you to panic. Why some career politicians should resort to alarmist rhetoric is clear. Politicians say things because saying such things will win them elections or help them consolidate power by transferring wealth from the groups that oppose them to the groups who support them. It's a strategy as old as politics itself. What is more puzzling is why people like Thunberg and so many other young people would be gripped by environmental alarmism. Why is environmental alarmism so popular, especially among the younger generation? Schellenberger offers an explanation based on several factors. First, there is the appeal to nature, the common belief that natural is always better than the artificial. Most of us think this way, even if we are unconscious of it. Appeal to nature, however, is a fallacy. Natural things are not inherently better than artificial things. A significant number of cancers, for instance, are the natural consequence of the natural decay of the natural occurring radioactive isotopes in our own bodies. Should we be happy if we get cancer in this natural way? Another example is the chlorination of tap water. Before scientists discovered this technique, waterborne diseases such as cholera and dysentery were rampant around the world. The total number of people who died from such disease throughout history is in several hundred millions. And unfortunately, millions of people continue to die from them in poor countries where water chlorination is still not a dependable part of the infrastructure. Should we oppose chlorination because it is unnatural? A related thought process has to do with how we think through the limited information we get from our immediate environment as people who live in industrialized societies. Artificiality is a consequence of economic development. As we become more prosperous, more and more of the environment we live in becomes unnatural. Many people react to this change with panic. If everything the eye can see are artifacts, nature must be dying. We must be on the verge of a disaster. However, this is a very fallible way of thinking. Just like I can't infer from the weather in my town anything about the global trends in temperature, precipitation and such, I cannot infer anything about the robustness of the world's ecosystems from the fact that all I can see in my office are objects made in a factory. And as I discussed in the lecture about the sixth great extinction, the science of ecology is complicated. It's very hard to measure how well a given ecosystem is doing on the whole. And even knowing the specifics require us to look beyond our immediate environment. By some metrics, the life on Earth seems to be doing better than it was a hundred years ago. For instance, whales, which were once on the verge of extinction, are back to pre-Columbian numbers. Of course, we would not know that unless we look beyond our immediate surroundings, which is something very few people do. Another related idea is Neo-Malthusianism, the belief that resources and ecosystem integrity cannot withstand indefinite growth. Again, humans saw immense economic growth in the last century and a half. The world population and the rate at which we consume resources is simply mind-numbing. It is intuitive to think that this pace cannot be sustained, and if we don't scale down, we will meet a Malthusian catastrophe. Next, there's environmental anti-humanism, which feeds from the items listed above. This is the belief that life on Earth would be better off without humans or with much fewer humans. Many environmentalists dream of a world where human population is scaled back substantially or completely so that the scars we cause to the planet can heal in time. 
They subscribe to a romantic idea of nature, where if we leave nature alone, it will find harmony and stay there. Then there is secular apocalypticism, the belief that the world as we know it is under an existential threat, and this perceived threat gives lost souls like Thunberg a sense of purpose. Apocalypticism, the belief that the world will soon end, is not new. Indeed, most religions either emerged as apocalyptic belief systems or evolved into one. The oldest major religion that emerges as an apocalyptic faith is Judaism. Ancient Jews rebelled against the Roman Empire three times ostensibly based on the apocalyptic prediction that a successful revolt and the construction of the Third Temple would be the prelude to the end of the world. Islam too emerged in an apocalyptic form. Muhammad, for example, predicted that the world would end shortly after the Muslim conquest of Constantinople. And Christianity was also decidedly apocalyptic. Early Christians believed that Christ's second coming was imminent. In Matthew's, Mark's, and Luke's Gospels, Jesus is reported to promise that some of his followers shall still be alive by the time he returns to establish the kingdom of heaven. And of course, today many Christians, Jews, and Muslims still believe that the end is near. 41% of American Christians, for instance, believe that Jesus will return by the year 2050. And it is easy to understand why so many people would find such a prediction appealing. Think about the alternative. Our lives are lived at an arbitrary and insignificant point in a long and meandering history of our species. Nothing we do has the significance of the final acts of humanity. But if we are among those who will witness the end of the world, we are special. What we do matters in a way no act in history ever mattered. This gives people a sense of meaning and purpose that is hard to reproduce in any other way. My point, however, isn't about religions and religious people alone. Indeed, the popularity of the belief that the end is coming has been a pretty consistent part of human cultures throughout history. It is more likely that many major and minor religions piggybacked on and exploited this given of human psychology rather than the other way around. This is why, religious or secular, a significant number of people find it easy to believe that the world may end soon. Of course, an ideological framework such as religion makes such a belief much more credible in the eyes of the individual. If one is raised to believe the doctrines of a religion that has an apocalyptic outlook, it is no wonder they should expect their Messiah to return any day now and cast the final judgment upon creation. Similarly, environmental alarmism piggybacks on and explores the same human tendency, the disposition to once see one's life as part of the final chapter of history. Religious or secular, we are already naturally inclined to believe that the end is near. The predictions of the impending environmental catastrophe only lends credibility to that inclination when that credibility cannot be found through religion for whatever personal or evidentiary reasons. According to Schellenberger, this is in part why so many young people are drawn to environmental alarmism. In the Western world, religion is on decline. Moral relativism, the idea that there is no objective right or wrong, is rampant which makes it very hard to construct and maintain a positive self-image and see one's moral existence as part of a meaningful narrative. Feeling lost in this fog of moral ambiguity and existential angst, young people are drawn to a fantastic ideology where the world is in peril and it needs to be saved. Things are black and white. There are clear good guys and clear bad guys. What needs to be done is beyond dispute. So Schellenberger thinks that alarmism is popular in part because it scratches a psychological itch religion and mysticism used to scratch before we realize that we are just upright apes and there is no God. Schellenberger stops his psychoanalysis here, but I will toss in one more thing as bonus. Anti-capitalism slash anti-consumerism, which is the belief that capitalism and consumerism are morally and ecologically untenable. Inspired by historical and contemporary critics of capitalism and consumerism, many educated people in the West think that a collapse is inevitable, if not imminent. This feeds into the anxiety about environmental disaster. What do you think about all of this? Is Schellenberger being charitable to environmentalists? 
or is he dismissing their legitimate concerns as the turmoils of juvenile minds? But what is the alternative to apocalyptic environmentalism? After 274 pages and 1,229 footnotes, Schellenberger finally gets around to spelling out the alternative. He calls it environmental humanism. I will leave you with the following words, which I think comes closest to stating the gist of this alternative. Humans are not unthinkingly destroying nature. Climate change, deforestation, plastic waste, and species extinction are not, fundamentally, consequences of greed and hubris, but rather side effects of economic development motivated by a humanistic desire to improve people's lives. A core ethic of environmental humanism is that rich nations must support, not deny, development to poor nations. Specifically, rich nations should lift the various restrictions on development aid for energy production in poor and developing nations. It is hypocritical and unethical to demand that poor nations follow a more expensive and thus slower path to prosperity than the West followed. As always, I look forward to hearing what you think about all this. And this brings me to the end of this lecture. Send me a message if you have any questions. Thank you for your patience and I'll catch you next time.